My name is Amy Streit, and I'm the new CEO with Voices for Virginia's Children. I want to welcome and thank you for joining us as we share the 2021 General Assembly results. For those of you who are new to Voices, it's our mission to champion public policies to improve the lives of Virginia's children. We are the Commonwealth's only independent multi-issue child policy and advocacy organization and home to the Kids Count Data Center for Virginia. So what's been important this year? All of us have navigated two crises, COVID-19 and the inequities caused by racial and social injustices. A bright light has been shown on systems that are either flawed or broken. And we know that policy and advocacy work make a difference and create opportunity for lasting change. Now more than ever, we have the opportunity to build systems that are more responsive, more inclusive, and more equitable. We embedded equity into our policy agenda and back that up with equity impact statements in all areas of focus. To support that effort, we intentionally engage people with lived experience to share their stories with legislators. Our work has one goal in mind. We are determined to help children and their families achieve improved health and well being and greater stability. This year, with the support of many, we clearly succeeded in doing so. What we saw in Virginia's General Assembly session. The legislative session was conducted in a virtual environment and lasted 46 days. People who were most directly impacted by policy and legislation had more opportunities to engage and meet legislators through virtual Zoom meetings. Their voices were heard and amplified. The executive and legislative branches were in lockstep and working together. And lastly, there is a better than expected economic picture coupled with a federal relief that produced significant investments. Without question, there is hope and optimism as we move forward. And simply put, we could not do this work without your support. Know that we are grateful for your time and willingness to partner with us. Hi, I'm Emily Griffey, the Chief Policy Officer at Voices for Virginia's Children. I'm gonna cover some themes from our 2021 General Assembly session. As Amy mentioned, Virginia's revenue picture was better than expected. We thought we would be facing many cuts to, our, to programs facing impacting children and families, but the revenue picture became back better than expected and the General Assembly was even able to add even more money than the governor put in the budget. The General Assembly restored many of the uh, unallotted priorities that were uh, in place prior to the pandemic. So we made uh, investments in systems and programs for children that were a priority even before the pandemic began. And Virginia pulled down and maximized federal funding, relief funds and other funds for uh, cash assistance, childcare assistance, Medicaid. The big question that's especially on our minds today as the House moves to pass the American Rescue Plan is how will Virginia choose to spend these dollars and will the General Assembly come back to have to figure out how to spend those, that money? Another theme from the General Assembly was how legislation passed. This year, with the, there were restrictions on the number of bills that were introduced, but those that did pass passed with bipartisan support. There are only a few topics on our legislative agenda this year that had more party line support, um, including the resolution declaring racism as a public health crisis and priorities for passing paid sick days for essential workers. There were a few bills that we had that did not pass this year that include the expansion of paid family and medical leave, bills to reduce the number uh, of SOLs being take, taken in third through eighth grade, and bills eliminating the mandatory minimum sentences for um, criminal proceedings. As Amy touched on, there were some great opportunities in terms of advocacy this year with everyone working through a virtual advocacy session, a legislative session. It really helped to level the playing field where everyone could hop on to a Zoom call, whether they were a parent, a student, an early educator, a practitioner. And this helped to bring folks into the spaces where they could meet with their legislators and legislative staff 
and give more folks opportunities to weigh in. So we're really thanks, thanks to everyone who participated in one of the advocacy cohorts or an advocacy, virtual advocacy day, gave testimony or met with your legislator that provided a great opportunity to do that when we could hop onto those Zoom rooms together. Some of our biggest budget wins this year were restoring funding that better than expected revenue pictures certainly paid off. We tallied more than $257 million in new initiatives for children and families included in this most recent budget. And many of those will go into effect once the governor signs the budget and moving forward in July. We'll go into more of these details on during our presentation with the rest of our team from Voices. Some of the biggest legislative wins that will also go into details, but these are, are noteworthy for the role that they played in sort of changing the context, changing the climate in which Virginia legislative victories can occur. The first was being the first state in the South to declare racism as a public health crisis. The second was establishing new methods to stabilize childcare and help to make it affordable and providing support for the sector and for parents itself. And policies that started to dismantle systems of oppression that provided better access to health insurance, removed barriers to public assistance. And these types of policies are, are long sought after wins. Uh, next, I will switch to my colleague, Chloe, to talk a little bit more about some of our legislative victories. Hello, everyone. My name is Chloe Edwards. I'm the Advocacy and Engagement Manager at Voices for Virginia's Children. Uh, like my colleague Emily mentioned, we had a huge victory in Virginia um, declaring racism as a public health crisis and being the first in the, the South really uh, causes us to serve as a trailblazer and an example for other states as well. As noted on this graphic, there are some key implementation steps related to this, such as expanding the Virginia Department of Health's Office of Health Equity, um, to ensure policies address racism uh, and are implemented in an equitable way. The second is uh, creates the commission to examine racial inequity in Virginia law permanent. Uh, there's also implicit bias training for elected officials and uh, public providers. Uh, it also establishes a category of terms and a glossary of definitions related to health equity. And then lastly, community engagement with those the most impacted by racism. Want to note that this is a first step. Um, it's, it's a starting path, but it's certainly not the finish line as far as um, what Virginia can additionally do to ensure that we're investing funding and implementing these steps more further. But this is a, a first step in diagnosing the issue of racism as a public health crisis. There is also the One Virginia Plan uh, related to House Bill in 1993 that positions the state as a national leader in building a statewide strategy to advance diversity, equity, and inclusion in our systems, um, agencies, and operations. It requires state agencies to establish a comprehensive diversity, equity, and an, an inclusion uh, plan across uh, systems. Next slide. Uh, around health insurance access, really our uh, legislative plan uh, priorities this year expanded access to uh, impacted populations uh, by race, uh, impacted by racism and expanded health insurance access to undocumented immigrants. Um, starting summer of 2021, we've, uh, there's been a coverage of prenatal services through cost savings from a Medicaid match. Uh, this allows payment for prenatal, prenatal care coverage for income eligible immigrant mother, mothers through Medicaid. Uh, secondly, we continue to work on uh, combating maternal and infant mortality disparities. So there is Medicaid coverage through a doula benefit that will further contribute to decreasing that disparity that we see. We continue to work on our Medicaid and FAMIS work, uh, which uh, directly impacts low, um, low income mothers. 
So there was continued expansion of postpartum health coverage this General Assembly session. And then lastly, we didn't quite uh, we didn't quite further our work around Medicaid funded home visiting benefit, which is an evidence-based program um, that further decreases that maternal infant mortality disparity, but there was a language directing the state to uh, continue planning for assessing the Medicaid costs related to funding the home visiting benefit. Next slide. We're continuing to uh, further our food justice work. For quite some time, we've uh, heard from the community feedback related to rural and urban food deserts. Uh, we worked with De Delegate McQuinn and the American Heart Association and here in Virginia on the Virginia Food Access Investment Fund and are pleased to share that um, there was investment in that fund again this General Assembly session. What this will cause is uh, investment to beef up uh, the retail industry in these communities so that we can further increase access to fresh and nutritious foods. Uh, we didn't quite, quite make the, um, quite make uh, great strides around the Produce RX program, but there has was still some successes this session related to um, a study to establish the Produce RX program. This is quite um, historical because once uh, we are able to make those cost investments, Virginia will be the first state in the nation to have a Produce RX program. So someone could go and the uh, Medicaid chip population to um, through a diagnosis from their qualified health care provider, they could go to a market and um, get access to fresh and nutritious foods. So this is quite historical. Uh, and then when it comes to economic security, we know that there's some overlap uh, when it comes to someone's ability to be healthy. And so we are pleased that uh, Virginia expanded broad-based categorical categorical eligibility for public benefits through the Temporary Assistance for Needy Families program. Next slide. When it comes to the overlap in trauma responsive in the mental health system, um, the Marcus Alert, Marcus Davis Peters, it was a young black biology teacher that was shot by Richmond police in 2018 in the midst of a mental health crisis. We also know that there's a related disparity when it comes to black men dying at the hands of police brutality. And we want to prevent this from uh, uh, further occurring to individuals most impacted by this population as well as children. There was funding to implement the Marcus Alert crisis response system. And similarly to support the implementation of that system, a new unified call-in number was also uh, established to respond to mental health crisis. We're continuing to serve on the Marcus Alert stakeholder group um, and have been preparing a presentation to how this can be equitably implemented uh, when it comes to children and families specifically. So we'll keep you all updated on that. We've continued to support the Virginia Hills uh, program, which uh, combats uh, trauma response, uh, trauma and the mitigation of trauma at the grounds level through further linking systems of care. There was funding included in the governor's budget to uh, continue the Virginia Hills program. And then lastly, funding was restored for the ACES interface training. Specifically, this would contribute to master trainers across the state. Many of you may have be connected to your trauma-informed community network who uh, is closely affiliates themselves with uh, the trauma training across the state. This will ensure that uh, stakeholders and providers are trauma-informed when interacting with children and families. Next slide. All right, and I will pass the mic to my colleague, Emily Griffey. Building on those mental health initiatives, this year the General Assembly took measures to meet children's mental health needs where they most often are in school settings and in, in their um, and when they're back in school. 
So there's two things that are moving forward this year that will help to provide more mental health and health services in school. One is a bill that will enable Virginia to pull down, enable local school divisions to pull down Medicaid funding to pay for health and mental health services for any Medicaid eligibility student, eligible student, even if they do not have an IEP, an individualized education plan. So this will require the state to, to provide some new administrative regulations about how local school divisions can access those funds. Um, but will be a one, almost a one-to-one -one match or better than a one-to-one -one match, depending on the Medicaid rate, for schools to pull down additional federal resources to expand access to health and mental health services. This could fund more uh, support staff positions. It could fund things like school-based health centers. It could fund additional screening. Um, it's really a great opportunity to maximize some federal resources to bring into schools for those social emotional student wellness initiatives. In addition, the state provided additional funding for those school-based support positions. Uh, the governor in, in his introduced budget included 27 million to increase the ratio of school counselors when it will now be funded one per every 325 students. And the General Assembly added additional resources to add those specialized support positions. And that category includes social workers, school psychologists, nurses, and applied behavioral specialists um, to their school divisions. Currently, 44 school divisions do not meet that ratio. They range the gamut from very large districts to very small districts. So these more students will have across the state have access to that specialized support in their school building next school year. Now I'm going to pass back to Allison. Hi everyone, my name is Allison Gilbreth. I'm the Policy and Program Director here at Voices for Virginia's Children and I'm going to be going over um, a little bit of family economic security and then going into our child welfare legislative and budgetary wins for this legislative session. So I'll start with the increase to TANF. This is temporary assistance for needy families. It's direct cash assistance to low income families. We saw in 2020, there was a 15% increase. And with this legislative session um, that just passed, uh, they included an additional 10%, bringing the average payment per household to $397 per month. We know that that's not, doesn't sound like quite a lot of money, but it's something that really helps bring families out, out of poverty. And we will continue to advocate um, as we work to bring the TANF amount closer to where it should be with inflation. If you'll go to the next slide. So I wanna talk first about the Family First Prevention Services Act. I know for a lot of you who are watching this uh, recording and have heard about the Family First Prevention Act that was actually signed on the federal level in 2018 are wondering, when is this going to be implemented? I thought this had already happened. Uh, for the most part, uh, Virginia did talk about implementing this program much earlier, but with the pandemic, many things were delayed. And actually across the nation, most states aren't implementing Family First until July of 2022. So we're still quite a bit ahead of the curve. If you look at the continuum towards the bottom of the screen, you'll see the continuum of what we want for children in foster care um, and also children who prior to entering foster care. The purpose of the Family First Prevention Services Act is to prevent the entry of children entering into foster care. It's something that a lot of you who are on the front lines have wanted to do, but you haven't had the financial lever to switch um, for those kind of services for families. You could only provide them once something had occurred which was a, one of the biggest challenges in child welfare. You'll see in this continuum, it starts all the way up from kinship relative foster homes all the way to out of state residential placements. Family First decentivizes those residential group home, everything from orange on and really prioritizes kinship care um, and really trying to keep children out of care. With the 2020 legislative or 2021 legislative session, uh, it included budgetary funding to include 143 local prevention service positions to help with the implementation of Family First. 
again, this is another one that may sound like a lot of positions. It's certainly going to be a lot of work to um, get a whole, all 143 on board, but it's a long way to go to and make every single local department have a prevention unit. So look for more of this to come in the next several years. It also establishes centers for evidence-based practice so there's uh, about 16 million that was included to help us scale up those evidence-based services. When I say that word, what I'm talking about are those in-home parenting skill classes, the mental health services for families, things that we know work to help prevent children from entering into foster care. Again, we didn't see um, as much dollars as we would like to truly scale up statewide, but this will get the ball rolling as we move to implement in July of 2021. And I also want to cover two bills that passed this legislative session around kinship care. If you've been following Voices Advocacy work over the last five or more years, you'll know that kinship care has been a priority for our organization for a long time. And if you're asking yourself why kinship care, it's because truly data shows that children do better when they have to be removed from their family of origin when they go to be with kin. That means that they're going to have reduced um, impacts of trauma. They're more likely to achieve permanency. That means before they turn 18, they are in a permanent home and they're less likely to have placement changes and disruptions. Uh, and so I'll start with the bill on the left-hand side of the screen and that's House Bill 1962, where he dubbed it the Ken First Bill of Virginia with Delegate Wendy Goditis. And in a nutshell, what this bill does is it puts in code our theme of what we want Virginia to be. We want for when children are about to enter into foster care for Virginia to always look for kin first. The other two really, really cool things that this bill does is it allows children as young as 12 years old to be able to have a say and to help establish their plans. Right now, the code only allows for children 14 or older with this lowering it down to 12, we know that there are many young people who are 12 years or older who can say, I actually want to stay with my grandmother instead of going to live in a non-relative placement. And it empowers young people in the process of their care. The other really cool thing this does in code is it actually codifies the word fictive kin. It's something that those of us in the profession use all the time, but it actually had never been in code. What this means is it will give validity to relationships that children have with people who aren't blood related to them. This might look like someone the child has known since they were born, maybe a godparent who has served as a regular and consistent person in that child's life. Now that child is about to enter into foster care. Well, with the help of this bill, not only are they going to be recognized as a fictive kin person and be prioritized for placement, it also switches the trick or the light um, rather so that they can access some financial services and some case management services for that child. So all really good things packed into one bill. Now, if we switch to the other side of this slide and look at Senate Bill 1328, State Funded Kinship Guardianship Assistance Program. Some of you may be thinking, don't we already have a kin gap program? What is the difference here? We do have a federal kinship guardianship program that we brought down in Virginia two years ago. This expands the eligibility category for that program because now we're not only going to be using federal dollars, we're also going to be using state dollars. And what this means is approximately 90 or so more children and youth will be able to enter foster care with a relative placement and that relative will be able to access the same foster care maintenance payment, receive case management services. And really the important difference here is it will be considered a permanent placement for that child. Sometimes we know that children get placed with kin and they're not going to be moving back into their family of origin, but in order for that kin placement to continue to provide for them, they still really rely on the either the foster care maintenance payment or some of the case management services. Um, and so they don't want to completely step away from um, the child welfare system. This gives that family that flexibility to stay in this guardianship assistance program 
while also being deemed now you have that child has achieved permanency for the sake of that child um, and some legal benefits uh, come along with that as well. So we're thankful to Senator Mason, who's also the Foster Care Caucus co-chair for getting this bill to the finish line and for um, all of the advocates who supported kinship care over the last several years. We thank you because for the first time, I would say as, an, um, as a person who works at Voices for Virginia's Children, when I say the word kinship care to legislators, they automatically know what I mean. They know because of the Ray Richardsons of the world and the Janets and all the people who have been involved and invested in our work where I used to have to spend the first 15 to 20 minutes of a legislative meeting breaking down what that means, what that population looks like. They remember because they know and remember because they remember you who actively were involved in this process. So this would not have been possible without your assistance and I truly thank you. Now I'm gonna switch it back over to Emily. Yeah, and so great for Allison to remind us of the long haul of advocacy and that your stories really do make a difference. You may not always see the immediate results, but year after year, you will hopefully get that payoff. The, this initiative right here about affordable childcare is one of those examples of the many times that advocates for early care have said childcare is just unaffordable for everybody and for especially for, for families who are struggling financially. So what this bill does is as additional federal resources are coming to Virginia for child care, it expands our child care eligibility in, in several important ways. One is to increase the income eligibility levels to about $89,000 for a family of four that income eligibility depends on your family size that is the same throughout the state of Virginia. In order to meet that new income eligibility threshold, a family must have a child who is under five and not yet in kindergarten, but any of their children in the family will receive assistance. The additional federal funds are also going to be used to expand eligibility for a parent while they're looking for a job so they can now get assistance before they have find work and while they're looking and that's that applies to any age child it also will immediately um, eliminate the child support enforcement requirements where and to receive child care assistance a family would have had to have a non-custodial parent participate in the child support enforcement program that will no longer be the case the best news about this bill is that it will has an, an ASAP effective date and is headed to the governor's desk to implement. We believe sometime in late March, early April, this uh, new eligibility for childcare will open up and these new criteria will be in place for families who are looking for care, um, looking for work and want to find affordable, accessible childcare programs. This child care assistance is a great deal that has often gone under the radar. Uh, the payment amount depends on the age of your child and the type of care that they receive and also the locality in which, the, with, which you receive the care. But for example, if you're looking for infant care in a center in Henrico, you would receive about $1,000 a month that would go to your child care provider for this assistance. This bill is designed to use about $60 million in federal resources that came about in the December federal response plan. But there are plans uh, and hopes that this can continue with additional federal money as well. Right now, it is a time limited program through the end of July. Uh, the only piece of this that is currently permanent will be the elimination of the child support enforcement criteria. So as the rest of these pieces move forward, we'll be watching and hope that a lot of families get enrolled and that we can continue to advocate for these barriers to can permanently remove these barriers to assistance like the increased eligibility for income and while looking for jobs. Uh, the second area to improve the childcare sector is to improve compensation for our early childhood educators. Uh, early childhood educators throughout the state are paid an average of a less than $11 an hour. These are folks who have been working throughout the pandemic 
work with children during their most critical developmental period and provide care, nurture, and education for our young children. Yet we haven't been able to uh, pay equitable wages to these women who are primarily women and primarily women of color because childcare already costs so much. So we have to find some ways to uh, put dollars into the childcare sector so that we cannot put the cost of in the further costs onto parents that continue to pay our early educators more. So there's two ways that we'll be able to do that this year. One is that the governor has increased $5 million for early childhood in incentive awards. These are also called the teacher recognition grants uh, that come to the partners who are working on with publicly funded programs. It's about a $1,500 incentive for, for early childhood educators to participate in that. And this additional five million will go to serve more uh, early educators. Uh, Senator McClellan also had a bill this year to um, stabilize the childcare sector. And part of it will be looking at how we pay for childcare in the future, rather than paying that, that voucher or that payment directly to the provider the state will look into creative ways to pay based on enrollment and based on the true cost of providing high quality care, or we can bump up wages and compensation based on where, where they should be for a competitive market, market and what early educators provide and look at providing wraparound services for children as well. So the state will be looking at creating pilot programs using our existing, existing childcare block grant resources for that. So with every legislative session, there's always more work to do. We typically um, have a lot of things on our legislative agenda. Of course, during a pandemic, there were so many needs for children and families and some things didn't quite make it to the finish line. One of the things that we were disappointed in was providing um, paid family and medical leave. One of the reasons voices really actively supported this is because we know that parents were making hard choices between do I go to work to provide for my child or do I risk being going to work sick and possibly infecting others or um, making myself sicker? So we were disappointed to see that the legislature didn't get this to the finish line. The other area that we will continue to work on but really are disappointed is establishing a permanent staff and permanent children's cabinet for Virginia. The children's cabinet is an excellent example of how we highlight children in our governor's office, how we ensure that secretaries in the governor's office work across offices to high level things and collaborate on big issues. And we wanted to see that permanent. It wasn't included in this budget, but we will actively work again. So if you're continuing to work with us, we just know that it will continue to be highlighted. And the last thing we continue, what we will continue to do is to look for a way to provide more general funds to support our community-based trauma-informed community networks. They're doing such, and thank you if you are a member of one of those, but they're doing such innovative quality work for children and families on the community level. We want to see um, our legislature invest in that process. And so we will continue to advocate for changes, or not changes, but investments in that area as we move forward as an organization. So thank you, Emily, Allison, and Chloe. While we recognize that the General Assembly meets for a very short period of time, we know that this policy work lasts for a year or longer. Um, oftentimes we're asked, um, how can I be supportive of voices or how can I join in on the efforts? So, so here what you'll find are opportunities to join us. So please join us in network and coalition meetings, share the information with youth families and frontline staff and seek their feedback and sign up for Voices mailing lists. For more information, I encourage you to go to our website at vakids.org. I wanna send a special thank you to those of you who have partnered with us in this work this year or for a number of years. And I also would ask that for those of you who may be interested in partnering with us, um, please join us in our efforts. Um, we cannot do this work alone. And we know that we are stronger when we work together and we can have greater impact 
when we work together. So thank you all very, very much.